Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the greatest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Then should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. But pardon and gentles all. The flat, unraised spirits that have dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? Or may we cram within this wooden no the very casks that did affright the air at Agincourt? Oh, pardon, since a crooked figure may attest in little place a million. And let us, ciphers, to this great account on your imaginary forces work. Suppose within the girdle of these walls are now confined two mighty monarchies whose high upreared and abutting fronts the perilous narrow ocean parts asunder. Piece out our imperfections with your thoughts. Into a thousand parts divide a man and make imaginary <coughs> puissance. Think when we talk of horses that you see them, printing their proud hooves in the receiving earth. For tis your thoughts that now must deck our kings. Carry them here and there, jumping o'er time, turning the accomplishment of many years into an hourglass. For which supply, admit me, chorus to this history. Who prologue by your humble patience pray gently to hear, kindly to judge our play. Prologue, Henry V by William Shakespeare. December 6, 1913, Montreal, Quebec. My dear Miss Lewis, your birthday letter was a very pleasant surprise, and the only letter of good wishes I got, save the attentions of my immediate family. Your kind remarks about the book were much appreciated. I've had a busy but uneventful autumn. Poor Dr. White has had quite a severe illness and has been in bed for nearly two months, but he now seems on the high road to health. Dr. Adami has just come back from Winnipeg and is off again to Denver this time. I, on the contrary, seem chained to my stable. I may go somewhere in the holidays, but duties loom large here. Forgive the brevity of this, and believe me when I say your letter was a real pleasure. With kind regards and all good wishes, yours very truly, John McRae, 160 Metcalf Street, <coughs> Montreal. Flanders, April 8th, 1915. My dear Miss Lewis, I was very pleased to get your letter, which just arrived this afternoon. I would have dropped you a note before this, but I left my address book at home, and I would forgotten the collegiate address. You will be surprised to learn that I have been soldiering for eight months now. I sailed on July 29th, thinking that war would blow over off Newfoundland. We got the news, and after wandering, much of the seas we got to the Thames. It was a stirring voyage, but time is not allowed. As soon as I labeled, I, as soon as I landed, I cabled back to my old subaltern, who was the director of artillery. After a couple of weeks, I got back his answer that I had been posted back to our old regiment with my old rank, major, and I went back to Canada at once, joined at Volcartier, and was back in England by the middle of October. My job is on the staff of the 1st Brigade of Field Artillery. We have about 900 men, 750 horses, 18 guns, now in four batteries of four guns each. We had a terribly hard winter in England, the rainiest in 30 years. 
and were under canvas till early January. Early in February, we came over and went into the firing line at once, where we have been ever since. It is a stern job and a terrible war. For a solid month, our guns were in action all the time. For with modern gunnery, we fire at night as easily as by day, though we cannot observe one's fire. A brigade such as ours goes into the firing line, and the batteries are estimated to cover perhaps a mile of the German trenches. Guns are put into pits to shelter them and are covered over from the airplanes. A way forward in a ruined house or in some elevated space is the observing officer. Telephones connect all the batteries, the observation posts, the brigade headquarters, and back to the Army Corps headquarters. In our little farmhouse at our last position, we had a central 18 wires, 25 miles of wire. We carry about 35 telephones. The guns cannot see the target and are laid by Trigo instruments in the magnetic compass. If run at speed on known ranges, we can fire about 150 rounds per minute. So much for modern gunnery. Several times a day, the Germans would shell some part of our area, but we have so far had a light casualty list. Three weeks ago, we had a large part in a battle that had a light casualty list. One might call it a battle without expectation, and you probably know the name if you follow the papers. We were on the left flank, and our job was merely to keep on the opponents, keep them so busy that they could not reinforce. The village from which the battle takes its name was about three miles to our right front. The fight continued for four days, from the 10th of March on. And although the censor does not allow us to state losses, I see the American papers and the Canadian papers put ours into the five figures, while the Germans are said to have lost 18,000, exclusive of prisoners. Think of a battle like that, bigger than many great battles of history, and in this war, only the incident of a week. I wish I could describe the country. Low-lying, flat, marshy, and desolated. Villages in utter ruins, churches especially. Because the steeples serve for observation posts, deserted for the most part. Fire having usually completed what the shells left. Farmhouses in many cases destroyed or still left standing or loopholed in sandbags. The long rows and the fields of roads are often holed by shells. And in the last two weeks, the daisies and the daffodils, all very pretty and peaceful. But the guns go all the time. And everywhere, graves, graves, graves. After a battle as such that I spoke of, our regiments are busy burying the German dead as well as our own. Much of it done by filling in the trenches already half destroyed. It is said that there has never been such artillery fire in the course of the world's history as in this action. But with it all, it's not an unhappy life, if a very unsafe one. We are comfortable, well if roughly fed. There's lots of fresh air. Cleanliness is a trifle difficult at times. Before I left, a rich friend gave me a horse, an Irish hunter called Bonfire. Half the time he gets gunfire. <coughs> He's a perfect pet. Each parcel I get from home has a couple of lumps of sugar for him. And when sugar runs out, as it soon does, he is very grateful for a piece of gingerbread. These are rare luxuries. My groom just loves him. Yesterday, Bonfire had a mishap. He got his neck and his leg damaged. When my man came in this morning, he said, Bonfire's better. Yesterday, he was just like a baby, wanted to be petted all day. But this morning, he was biting me again when I was grooming him. I must say that this biting is a mere conventional game between them. Bonfire's a big chestnut, and I think him very handsome. 
This is a long letter, but I know it will interest you, most of it at least. One has to suppress all the local color in the shape of names and military information. What I've said of procedure and gunnery is common to all armies in the field and does not challenge censorship. The McGill Hospital called me to ask if I would take the job of being head of the medical side with the rank of lieutenant colonel. I accepted on condition of not joining until they were in the field. If I am spared, I will probably go over to them. But they won't be here for some time yet. As to the end of the war, I never uh, give any thought to it. But what is the use? I suppose it will go on for a year or two, probably get worse before it gets better. Nor have I let myself make any plans ahead. However, I am a firm believer in the old adage that a man is immortal until his work is done. Thank you for your letter. Should you come to drop a note in answer, address Major John McRae, 1st Canadian Artillery Brigade, Expeditionary Force, France. It's regular French postage, five cents, but no registration. With all good wishes for a happy holiday, and that you may find your family safe and well, yours very truly, John McCray. Northern France, May 15th, 1915. My dear Miss Lewis, very many thanks for your letter and the parcel which came today. It was delicious. And I assure you, I'm very grateful for it. Bonfire thanks you too for his contribution. He got two slight wounds at the terrible battle of Ypres, but is now all right, I'm glad to say. We've had a terrible 17 days, terrible fighting all the time, we never had our boots off even. Even during that time, uh, let alone our clothes. When the French line broke on the 22nd of April, we were three miles behind on our way in. We waited for orders all night while the French fleeing and wounded and the civilians from Ypres. Women and children streamed past us. At dawn, we were sent in on the gallop and went far up towards the German lines to a spot on the canal. And there we sat for all that time. For the first eight days, we were with the French. And for the latter nine, we were firing across our own front in support of our own troops. The Germans in tremendous strength and very strong. Artillery kept hammering at us all the time. And we were not supporting French attacks, we were repelling German attacks. And on Sunday the 9th, there were five. I'm proud to say we held the line and gave not one inch. We suffered heavily in men, horses, and guns, but I know we gave better than we got. And the German casualties on our eight miles of front were enormous. And our holding enabled the French to go forward so splendidly. Ours was not a showy part of the show. We were tremendously proud of the splendid work that our men and horses did. You will realize that for art artillery we suffer when I say that our casualties were about half of the men in the fighting line. The rest have to stay far back with the horses and the ammunition. The shelling was constant and terrible every day and throughout three nights. We got steeped in the horrors of war. I had to say a service for the dead and bind up the living British, Canadian, French, even an Algerian. One Turco recited a prayer and mentioned Allah and Muhammad all while I was dressing his wounds. Forgive the irregular and messed up nature of this. We are hardly rested. We got out on Sunday night and we're back in the fighting line last night again. However, it is quieter here.
Many thanks for your kindness. It is much appreciated. Yours very truly, John McRae. France, May 31st, 1915. My dear Miss Lewis, no, your parcel did not go astray, and its counterpart arrived safely two days ago and was as welcomed as the other one. We ate the sweets, and Bonfire thanks you very much. We had again almost continuous action, and we are near the right of the British line in a hot enough corner. We've had fighting 31 out of the last 39 days. We have not had our clothes off for the last eight. We're living out in the open, in dugouts in fact, near a ruined house pretty close up to the Germans. A little ahead of us is the ground that we've taken from the Germans. And it is, or it was when we got here, a scene of war. The dead sat around in ruined trenches as if they were still alive, or lay out in horrid grotesqueness. Hundreds were scarcely buried, or only partially so, rifles, jackets, helmets, and all the sorts of litter lay in disorder. The flies buzzed suggestively, the stench of three-day-old battle hung over everything is a very terrible war. You say you are a pacifist, but you did not define the term. I greatly dislike fighting for my own part. But here I would do nothing else. Here everybody wants peace, but nobody has any idea of making it, except in the way of killing Germans. A very terrible and significant thought, but a simple one. I could go further and say that a thousand average men here, taken at random in the presence of hourly danger, are living, in spite of some profanity, cleaner and more spiritual lives in body and soul than a thousand citizens plucked at random at a country of peace. I feel sure that I'm speaking the truth in this. I think it's one of the few blessings of war, but it is a great one. In the presence of danger that may take your life at any minute, opinions or points of view, pacifist or militarist, do not seem to matter at all. A lot of things that one usually bothers about drop into insignificance. For example, everybody gets newspapers and magazines, but nobody has any patience to read them. The likes of the Bible and Shakespeare pass the test. But the dribble that passes current seems to discuss even the tongue. It's a strange psychological state. Perhaps, owing to that, I have scarcely seen three poems since I've been here that are worth one reading. The war has yet to succeed in raising the poet. Perhaps never will. The current verse seems more than ever below contempt. Since I began to write, Eight or ten, probably 100 pound shells have fallen a comfortable distance of five to six hundred yards to the south. The day between yesterday, we had a terrific dusting. In an hour or so, more than over 230 shells from 45 pounds to 100 pounds in an area of 20 yards square. <coughs> six or seven landed in the little garden in which we live. But thanks to good dugouts, none of us were hit. I wrote you some particulars of our battle of Ypres. No one seems to know just how many fresh troops Germany put on our five-mile front, but we know two army corps, some have said half a million. The battle lasted 21 days, and the casualties on both sides, I see, are estimated at 210,000. About half of those in the entire Civil War. Certainly the scale here dwarfs any previous knowledge of warfare. 
I've got orders to join my new corps and shall report back when my successor arrives. My next address will be number three, General Hospital, Canadian Expeditionary Force. No country needed, either England or France, will answer. I hear I'm also to be Lieutenant Colonel, which is beside the mark again. Should I get safely back? I know that I'll miss the life at the front, trying though it is, but I shall be glad to for my people's sake, for they can't help but worry over the danger of this existence. Forgive the random nature of this. The short break. I appreciate the biscuits you sent. They were a great treat. I'm deeply grateful to you. At hospital, I shall not need supplies, for they are procurable there. With all kind regards, believe me, yours very truly, John Gray. France, August 26th, 1915. My dear Miss Lewis, you must have had a very fine trip to the West. I suppose by this time you're back preparing for the college term. We, on the other hand, are setting our looks for a harsh winter. We'll be under canvas in a very bleak spot. Life would be pretty bad. I can't say that I like the life here as well as at the front, though it's much safer and my family likes it better on that account. Nor does it strike me that the work is necessarily of any higher a grade, for I attach a good deal of importance to the work of helping to destroy Germany. You yourselves are having a bad enough time of it at present. I'm afraid it is a serious thought for a nation to go to war, that it should not be done lightly. There's no doubt that if we do not defeat Germany, your turn will come next. Strange to say, I don't see much desire here on anyone's part for the U.S. to come in. They're afraid that the pro-peace and pro-Germany party would try to get favorable terms for Germany. And if the U.S. were in the war, they might have some right to speak as participants. While as outsiders, they'll have none. My own feeling is that if there's a declaration of war, Germany will get to the U.S. in some way or other. With the result that you as a nation will soon be as belligerent as the belligerents. Bitter is not the exact word. Determined represents the idea better. There's only one voice that I ever hear, that the job is to be done thoroughly if it takes our entire lifetimes. Hospitals running smoothly, quietly. <coughs> our trains come in cheaply at night and have not been frequently lately. I made a personal appeal to headquarters to be allowed to keep my dear friend Bonfire, for an order had come that our horses would be turned in. I made it on sentimental grounds and it was granted. So I'm very happy to say the least. We have a Harvard hospital next door to us here. We're elated that we've been able to hit them up at baseball. From this you should gather that life is not all seriousness. Many thanks for your letter and good wishes. Yours very true, John McCray. <coughs> December 31st, 1915, France. My dear Miss Lewis, thank you for your letter at the end of September, too long unanswered, and for the little booklet so beautifully printed on the Dolomites. You have a very happy knack for description, I assure you. Your letter was a welcome tribute to a good cause, because I know that you're near to the great stronghold of German Americans. For my own part, I have a sentiment to the rightness of the Allied cause. That's quite apart from the facts that my reason tells me. I suppose that such feelings of faith are great assets. Germany must surely, day by day, begin to see what a grim proposition she has laid for herself. I sincerely hope that nothing happens to the Kaiser. 
I want him to live and see and feel to the utmost what he has done to his beloved Germany. This is very near to the end of 1915, and I must say I have no hopes of getting home in 1916. But if 1917 goes by also, I shall begin to think it's time to get home. <coughs> when all is said, 1915 has been a pretty good year to us. On Christmas Day, the officers' mess invited 30 of the sisters who were encamped at dinner. The tables were really beautiful. After dinner, we danced in one of the huts. And on Christmas Day, we had service and Christmas hymns, which the sisters had practiced. Altogether, it was great fun. I enclosed a copy of some verses I had in Punch on December 8th. A literary friend of mine wrote saying that he recognized them as mine, even though they were unsigned, which I took to be very flattering praise. I hear from home that my father, his lifelong military man, is now raising the 43rd battery of field artillery. He's past 70, but looks 55. He was greatly pre uh, pleased at his chance. He volunteered for any service one day after the war broke out. Our life here in the country goes on quietly. My dear old bonfire and I ride all around the countryside between the rainstorms. I'm still tenting with a small oil stove for very cold snaps. I'm really comfortable enough. My very good wishes for a happy new year, and thank you for your kind Christmas remembrances. Yours very truly, John McCray. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them, to die, to sleep no more. And by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. To die, to sleep, to sleep perchance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death what dreams may come, when we have shuffled off this mortal coil, must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes when he himself might his quietest make with a bare bodkin. Who would fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose bore no traveler returns puzzles the will, and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus conscience does make cowards of us all. And thus the native hue of resolution is sickly o'er with the pale cast of thought. And enterprises of great pith and moment, with this regard, their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Hamlet, Act 3, Scene 1. <clears throat> January 3rd, 1917. Number 3, Canadian General Hospital. My dear Miss Lewis, thank you for the charming holiday sketches, which I greatly enjoyed in which I offer my congratulations. You certainly have a very light touch with the pen. We are hard at work and have had a pretty bad winter from a weather standpoint. I, I hope I never see a tent again. We've been shorthanded. We've had a good deal of sickness among many of the staff. I was laid out for a fortnight in November. 
my first illness since the war began, I'm thankful to say. Everybody here seems greatly pleased at the Allies' reply to the President. It was evident that the note was not welcomed, and people are glad that everybody may know that there is to be a finish. When the Allies get done with Germany, her mother will not know her. But this clearly has This clearly is going to take some time to happen. Nineteen seventeen has accounted for another two or three million men, which is quite certain. The trend of opinion among soldiers is that this will be the end of the notes until the war is won by fighting. Everybody believes in Wilson's sincerity and also his powerlessness in the matter. I hope I don't hurt your feelings saying this. I seem to remember you tended toward pacifism. Isn't that right? We all hoped that spring would hurry, for fuel is not plentiful. Bonfires very well, and sends his respects. <laughs> all good wishes for a happy 1917. Yours very truly, John Craig. Flanders Fields. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks, still bravely singing, <coughs> fly scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you, from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders Fields. John McRae, born November 30th, 1872, died January 28th, 1918. Thank you.